All right, what's the next one? Next one is <laughs> divine truth is of the thing apart, of itself apart, admits no variations or modifications. So let's put that into a more single word. Divine truth is absolute. Now, most people, when I've said that to a group who, if I've said that to a group who has never met me before, most of the time when I say that to people, there's this huge barrage of anger that comes out. And the reason why is because nobody wants to feel that somebody other than themselves knows the absolute truth. And there's an emotion behind that. Well, how do you feel? If somebody come up to you and said, oh, do you know the full truth about yourself? And you say, yeah, of course I do. Right? And they say, no, you don't. Actually, you don't know this, you don't know that, you don't know this, you don't know that. <laughs> Imagine that. If God, if God could speak to you directly and you'd be open enough to hear it, God could do this with you, right? He could list all the things within you that you're not being truthful about. Like, there might be a thousand of them. How do you think that's going to feel? Oh, it's pretty confronting at the start, right? But once I understand the divine truth is absolute, it actually simplifies my entire life. You see, before, I was thinking that, oh, that person has some truth, this person has some truth, and all of our truths are my truth, your truth, and all those sort of new age concepts. They will get very intellectually and philosophically confusing, do they not? Right? And you're saying to yourself that, yeah, that person just stole from me, and he's saying that that was his truth. I don't get that, you know what I mean? Like, there's lots of things you don't get in that, right? And if you've got a partner who's in this real... Um, like, there was one guy that I met uh, who was talking to his partner, and he was saying, yeah, I cheated on you last week, but, you know, that's your law of attraction, and that's your truth, and this is my truth, right? The truth is, you could look at it differently. You could look at it like I wasn't cheating on you. You could look at it like I was... Like he was going down this philosophical road, right, to, to actually detune himself from his own law of compensation, right, in order to placate his woman so that they could stay together. But he was using all of these, uh, what I would call, new age intellectual philosophical mumbo-jumbo in order to detune from truth. That's what he was doing. So, like, how does the wife feel under this circumstance? No. Oh, okay. Like, does she ever feel, oh, okay. Like, this is okay. Oh, it's an okay event. He cheated on me. It's an okay event. Does she feel like this inside of herself? No. Obviously not. When you know the truth is absolute, in other words, not him and not her, but God knows the absolute truth about that event. And all we need to do is find what that absolute truth is about that event. That means that both parties can now progress towards the absolute truth. And also, that also means, of course, that both parties are now going to progress towards being closer together, does it not? Because they're now finding an absolute truth. Now, they may be closer together emotionally, they might decide to be apart, but they're still going to be closer together than they ever were when they were together because of accepting the divine truth on the subject. This is the beauty of the truth being absolute. It doesn't need modification, ever. God's truth never will need ever in the future modification. Every modification that I make about something that I tell you, and by the way, I will make modifications about what I tell you. Why? Because I will learn more truth about what I'm telling you. And as I learn more truth, I have to say, oh, oh my understanding of that wasn't true. And I'll have to admit what the new truth is, won't I? So, and every one of us is going to have to do that in our own progression, in our own lives. There is this common viewpoint towards me that I know all the truth. Is that possible? No. no. Okay, so why do you expect it? <laughs> <laughs> it's not possible. The only person that knows all the truth is God. God is infinite in her capacity to understand all the truth. Am I God? No. no. I'm your brother. So am I ever going to be in that state? No. no. Never. I'm never going to be in that state. All I can do is connect to God as much as I can possibly connect to God. Now, obviously, when I'm at one with God, and then as I grow more and more and more in love, after at one minute, I'm going to connect to even God even stronger, more strongly and more strongly and more strongly. The more strongly I'm connected with God, the more truth I know. 
but I'm never going to know it all, ever. And if you expect me to, then you're in error. And if you expect yourself to, you're in error too. You're never going to know it all. Right? And what you will know, though, is going to be far in excess of what the average person knows. The reason why that is the case is because there's another truth, and that is, as you receive divine love, if you seek divine love first in your life, all these other things will be added to you. All of these other things are all the truths of the universe that other people spend eons of time, like literally hundreds of thousands of years trying to discover. You will discover in five minutes. Right? So there's all these truths. Like There's literally hundreds of thousands of those kind of truths. There's more than that. Of these kind of truths that you will discover in five minutes that other people have taken a hundred years to discover. Because you're on the divine love path and they're on the natural love path. So how do you discover them? You say to God, oh, I want to know about this truth. And God tells you. Right? But how's the other way to discover it? You're going to have to do experiment after experiment after experiment after experiment with your own life until you sort of think that you've got all the experiments down pat that you could ever come up with that would seem to prove this particular truth. And you know what? Even after you've done that, you will still not know it. You will just believe it to be true. So what man is doing now is investigating the creation in order to find truth. But God's truth is absolute. You don't have to investigate the creation. You've just got to investigate the creator. Once you connect with the creator, the creator has the ability to tell you all this truth. But if you refuse to connect with the creator, then yes, you are going to have to, if you want truth in your life, you are going to have to seek truth in this different way. This way of experimentation. So when I understand the divine truth is absolute within my soul, it just simplifies my life so much. I no longer have to experiment so much with truth. All I need to do is start facing the truth from God's perspective. And I will know whether I've got in the truth from God's perspective because if I'm not receiving divine love, I am out of harmony with truth in that particular thing. When I'm in harmony with truth, divine love will flow. When I'm out of harmony with truth, divine love will not flow. Straight away I've got a yes and no answer from God. Can you see that? So as soon as I'm in harmony, divine love flows. I know that's true. And I've sorted the question out in a few minutes. Questions that people have been asking for hundreds, sometimes thousands, and sometimes tens of thousands of years, you will get answers to in a few minutes because of that. So divine truth being absolute is really essential. What's the next one? Truth and love are always in harmony with each other. And in fact, if there's truth, so-called truth without love, or love without truth, then they're not. None of them are real. The only way that love is real is by being fully harmonious with truth. So we could say divine truth is fully harmonious with divine love. How does this affect me emotionally? At the emotional level, when I understand that divine truth is fully harmonious with divine love, I can understand the relationship of why I don't receive divine love. Because the only time when I'm not going to receive divine love is when I'm out of harmony with divine truth. So that makes everything really simple. Can you see that? For me to understand what's going on. I already know that I'm out of harmony. I don't have to work out, am I out of harmony? How do I find out whether I'm out of harmony? Well, you already know. If you're not receiving divine love, you're out of harmony. <coughs> that makes life really simple, just to know that. It might not make it that simple discovering why you're out of harmony, but your law of attraction is your remember, your messenger of truth. So that's already telling you this particular aspect of where you're out of harmony with. Right? So that simplifies that entire process. You notice over the page I've got some stuff about if I was praying for divine truth, I would, and then I, if I was paying for divine truth, I wouldn't. And if you look at under the section where there's a harmonious connection between those two, I've had many, many people say to me that they expect to receive divine love as soon as they ask for it. Now, 
the if I would have to put in front of that is, if I'm harmonious with divine truth, I can expect to receive divine love when I ask for it. Can you see the difference between those two states? Many people on the divine love movement around the world, they think they're receiving divine love, or they should be receiving divine love, when they're not, because they refuse to bring their life in harmony with divine truth. So can you see how essential truth is in this relationship? The, the relationship between truth and love? You notice too, I also say, also said, I will, if I'm praying for this truth, I will not inside of myself feel unjustly treated by God if I'm not receiving divine love under a certain circumstance. Will I? Because I'll understand straight away that I'm not receiving divine love because I'm not in harmony with divine truth on this whatever the matter is or whatever the groups of matters are generally. Now obviously the process of becoming at one with God is when I'm at one with God my, my truth now and this is the transition that occurs between the seventh and the eighth sphere my truth now will match God's truth. In other words all of my personal truth all of the emotions I have within me match God's emotions about all of the same subjects. It doesn't mean I'm a, a, some kind of controlled robot. What it means is I have complete free will, complete individuality. In fact, you'll find you have far more individuality than you have right now. Because right now, most of us are living our lives in harmony with what everyone else wants us to live in. Right? You will live your life totally in a state of free will. But every single emotion within you in that place will be harmonious with love and harmonious with truth. That's a really powerful place to live in. For your own life, like enjoying your own life. Now, there's another, the next one. Divine truth does not compromise even for the sake of peace. Doesn't compromise for peace. This is where we start having a lot of personal trouble, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How many decisions do we make in a single day where we compromise the truth or we don't speak the truth from our emotions because we know if we say it, something not so good might happen as a response on the other end? Well, divine truth doesn't do that, ever. Divine truth never compromises itself for the sake of peace. God never compromises with you, ever. God will never compromise with you. That's fantastic. Because it means that when you understand love relationships, none of them get compromised ever either. Right? But at the beginning, we often feel that we need to compromise, don't we, for peace. So how many of you in your life in the past have believed that love would compromise under certain situations. Right. So quite a lot of us, right? The truth is that love will never compromise under certain situations. Right. Love will never compromise and can never compromise for the sake of peace. So let's look at what's going on inside of us emotionally here. If I have a feeling in me that I've got to withhold the truth from somebody, or I've got to not say the truth because it will make them upset, can you see straight away that I'm no longer in harmony with divine truth? There's not peace either. And it's not peace either. It's a fictional creation of peace. It's not real. The soul is in total disharmony right, with the other person, but we're both saying, oh, that's not happening. Right? So the truth is that once I don't compromise truth within myself, for the sake of peace, I am bringing myself more in harmony with divine love. So, under those circumstances, I'm praying to God. I'm praying to God for divine truth. If I compromise for the sake of peace, at that particular moment, I am not praying for divine truth. I'm saying to God, I don't want your divine truth. I don't want even my truth. 
right? And I certainly don't want the truth of that person going to hammer me with if I say the truth to them. So divine truth never does that, ever. But ironically, when everybody gets into a state emotionally of accepting that truth, there is the most peace. Why is there the most peace? Because we're all focused on wanting to know what the divine truth is and living in harmony with divine love when we're in that state. So ironically, that's when there's the most peace. So, for example, if my partner comes to me and tells me something about her life, that, you know, like last week, um, you know that guy that I met down the street? Yeah, well, I slept with him. Now, that's a pretty confronting thing to hear if you're in a relationship, isn't it? Right. Now, she's not compromising for the sake of peace. So what she's doing is she's telling me the truth of something she did. My feelings, if I don't compromise for the sake of peace, is I will actually own my own emotions. I will not compromise my own emotions. So I won't just say, oh, you know, get a bit, a bit angry, walk around the place for a day or two and then say, oh, I was forgiven. Because it's highly unlikely that I'm actually forgiving them by doing that, right? I will actually work through it emotionally. I will actually work through the event emotionally. I will let myself feel my emotions about it. And I won't compromise those emotions either for the sake of peace. Because if I did, what I would actually be doing... So let's say I started compromising my emotions so because I wanted her to stay with me. I'm not addressing in her or myself the reason why she did it in the first place. Does that make sense? There's reasons in her emotionally why she slept with someone else other than myself if we were in a committed relationship. And I need to allow myself to look at that emotionally and she needs to look at that emotionally. If I compromise the truth in that situation, she may never look at that emotionally, and I may never look at it emotionally, but where are we? We're both not harmonious with love or God. So in the end, even in those events, we need to not compromise for the sake of peace. Even when you've made a mistake, don't compromise for the sake of peace. Admit your error. And the emotion in you will come up. You'll be able to feel those emotions, you'll be able to work through those emotions and release them. But you will never touch the emotion if you compromise the truth of the emotion. You'll never even work through the emotion there, ever. So for the majority of us, the emotions are not rising because we're not being truthful about what's actually there. And we need to become truthful about what's actually there before these emotions will flow. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Well, there's another uh, 10 or 11 points that I'd like to cover after a break. So we'll have a break now. And uh, we'll probably 30 to 45 minute break. And, uh, and then we'll cover some more points about divine truth. Yeah, th this discussion about truth is uh, quite often pretty confronting. Because a lot of the times what we're doing is we're always trying to get away and run away from the truth initially. And so when, when we're presented with truth, we often are just so confronted with it that we say, oh, do you mean in this situation, I've got to be truthful too. In that situation, I've got to be truthful too. And yes, in the end, I'm saying in every situation, you're going to be totally truthful. So it doesn't matter what the situation is. And you'll never want to cover over the truth. In fact, what's going to happen in your life is you will have a burning and passionate desire to live in truth 100% of the time. And you, in fact, will find yourself so enthusiastic about it that it's impossible for you to not live in that state. And so... Um, if I'm not yet in that state, then obviously there's just emotions of error that I need to work my way through. That's all I need to do. Now, the reason why it's such an important issue is that unless I'm in that state, every truth that I'm ever confronted with is going to feel so painful. It's going to be so stressful. It's going to be such a nightmare to face. It's a bit like at the moment each of us have a castle, right, that we've constructed around our soul. And every attack on that castle is going to be defend, defended generally by us very vigorously. And that's the issue we face. What we need to do is get out of that state and into a state where we're no longer defending the truth. Now, my Law of Attraction Day was interesting because in my break I had two men approach me and both of them, unbeknown to themselves, were in the state of vigorously defending their own truth and yet not wanting to know that. 
So no matter what I say to those people, I know that they cannot accept the truth that I'm telling. They, in one case, in one case it was because you felt you already knew it here. In the other case, it was because anything emotionally was to do, you know, was obviously not the truth. Yeah? Wants the truth to be intellectual. Remember, right at the start of this discussion, I said that the truths will be emotional and not intellectual. So if you think you know the truth about yourself intellectually, but you've yet to have the emotional experience, trust me, you do not know the truth. You do not know the truth yet until you have the emotional experience. Now, the intellectual experience is a part of it in the sense of knowing what the intellectual, like what the truth is intellectually, can help you have the emotional experience. But until you've had the emotional experience, you will not know the truth. You just think you do. And that state, by the way, is a very damaging state to you. Because you're going to believe that state and you're going to think you know things that yet you are yet to really know at the soul level. It takes a lot of effort to get out of that state and into the state of feeling the truth emotionally and having a desire to feel it emotionally inside of yourself and actually really feeling it, what it, what it is emotionally. And that's why... And the next time we get together, I think it is, I'm talking about the subject of emotions of self-deception. Because almost everyone that comes up to talk with me, most of the time have deep emotions of self-deception. And, and often when I identify those emotions of self-deception, they say, I already know that. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't know it. Because if they knew it, they would already be feeling it, and they're not feeling it. So while they may be intellect, it would be more correct to say, I am intellectually aware of that. <laughs> but the truth is that doesn't help you any. In, on the, uh, one of the websites, I've written a document about, uh, I think it's called Divine Love, Repentance and Forgiveness or something like that, and I can't, I can't remember what I told you, but I talked about this process of soul realisation and intellectual realisation. And I, and I list, the, what, there is five or six steps in the process of becoming intellectually aware that you have an issue that is not in harmony with love or truth. But you know, you can go through every one of those intellectual steps, which by the way are generally essential as an adult to go through. But you can go through every one of those steps and still never release an emotion and never change your law of attraction. And many of us are doing this by holding on to emotions of self-deception. And that's why I wanted to have that subject coming up soon to talk about. To actually have the soul changes occur, there is a whole nother process that needs to occur. And it has to occur at the heart level, the soul level, the emotional level. That's the level it has to occur on. And when those processes occur, then law of attraction changes instantly. And everything around you changes instantly as a result of your soul condition changing as you release the emotion. But most people I find are very fascinated with the intellectual process of realisation. And most people will come up and say, I know that, I know that, I know that. And I'm feeling, no, 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 you don't get this yet. Because you're saying you know that. But actually, no, you're not feeling that. So why is there this huge discrepancy? What's going on? There are blockages to the feeling of it. Does that make sense? Now, many of us will stay in that state for as long as we want. And you will stay in that state because free will dictates the state that you stay in. But it's not going to be very good for you in the long run staying in those states. And what we want to do is get out of that state. Now, one thing that Mary and I didn't describe was Mary first went through this discussion, didn't you, that when she was describing to you this process she went through a few weeks ago of writing down her past, basically, doing, doing an inventory of her past. Initially, it was done quite intellectually, wasn't it, darling? Like, you listed a lot of the stuff, you looked at it from a very um, positive viewpoint, looking at yourself, if you like. Didn't want to look at things very in a negative way. And this is what... The problem is for the majority of us, is we do one of these kind of inventories of our life, 
that we want to see we want to see ourselves positively. We don't want to see ourselves as God sees us. We want to see ourselves positively in the sense of, you know, we want to have a fictitious viewpoint of ourselves generally. And so what we'll do is we'll do one of these inventories and in the end process very little of emotion and say, oh, isn't it wonderful? I realised this about my father and I realised this about my mother and I realised this about my brother and sister and I realised this about all my relationships and this man, he was a terrible man and that man was a terrible man and we start going down all of this track of seeing all of our law of attraction but we don't relate it to ourselves. And instead what we do is we project all of what we're learning out onto everyone else that was in our lives and still don't see the point of it. In the end, it's about truth about yourself, your own condition. Now, when Mary and I did that first, and then, I, and then Mary asked me to help with the situation, I then went over everything again. I said, no, but that's not the truth. That's not the truth that you're... That's not the truth of that relationship. The truth of the relationship is this. What's that truth telling you? And that's when, when Mary had those realisations, she also had the emotions flowing. That's about how it happened, wasn't it, Mary? So the truth is, for the majority of us, you're going to want to do a little inventory or to do some of these things like a fear list that I've suggested to you, an anger list, or whatever else I've suggested to you, but you'll do it in a very untruthful way. And then you'll say to me, oh, but I've done that before. And it doesn't work. But no, it doesn't work because we're not truthful enough in the end. That's the only thing that makes these things work. And in the end, to be truthful enough means to be as truthful as God is with you. God sees absolutely every single emotion within you, positive or negative. doesn't matter to God. He sees absolutely everything. And we've got to see the same. What were, our, what were our motivations? Now, I've heard many of you come up to me and say, oh, my motivation was this. Motivation. I'm saying, no, 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 your motivation wasn't that at all. Your emotion, motivation was very negative, actually. It was to do with this. Oh, no, I don't agree with you about that. No worries, you don't have to agree with the word I say. But I know that in the end, if you don't look at that emotion, you will not progress further towards God. And it's up to you what to do with that. Does that make sense? Like... So many times lately I'm finding a person come up to me, ask me a question, I give them an answer. It's not the answer they wanted to hear, it's not what they believe. And so they go away saying, oh, AJ doesn't know what he's talking about. And honestly, um, you can believe that and I, I'm happy for you to believe that, in fact. I've done all I can to help you face the truth. That's all I need to do. But you are not going to progress that way. If every single interaction you have with every person you go up to them and say, what do you really feel about me or what do you feel is about my injuries? And they tell you, and then you say, oh, they, they would know. In the end, you're not going to look at your law of attraction. You're not going to see the answers that are coming at you constantly in your life. The truth is going to expose all that for you. And in the end, you will see things as God sees you, which is going to be the most powerful thing for you. Can you do it the other way around? Can we microphone? Microphone first. I was just wondering if you can do it the other way around and be overcritical of yourself instead of uh, <laughs> judge everything in the opposite. And so don't like view criticism truth. as truth. No. When you're overcritical of yourself, you're now judging yourself. Yes. Uh, like I suggest, I suggest that you shine a light on yourself really strongly and see absolutely every flaw. But I'm not saying that that's being critical of yourself. See, most of you are judging it as being critical of yourself, but that's not what I'm saying. When you shine your light, the light of truth, on you and expose absolutely everything in you, you're not being critical of yourself. You're being truthful with yourself. Critical with yourself is when you take that process and now judge it. And now judge yourself for having these things in you. Now you're being critical of yourself. And I'm not suggesting you do that. No, I really like that. But I'm, I am suggesting that you have to see absolutely every flaw. Absolutely every single one of them within yourself. Yeah. And God's, God's going to help you in that process, but God's not going to make you do it. We've been asking for that, and that seems to be more, I think that I'm seeing more, what I'm, my part in the thing. 
You're starting to see more of this. I don't blame anyone else. <laughs> but I suppose that's what you're blaming them. Well, the truth is, a lot of times we say, oh, I don't blame everyone else, but there is an emotion in me of wanting to blame others. So let's be truthful about it. For many of you, when you think about the harm that's been done to you in your life by ex-partners, parents, or whatever, you do feel an emotion of blame, do you not? You do feel an emotion of anger. You do feel upset. You do feel like they are. these emotions are the truth within you. Do you see what I'm saying? So don't go and tell yourself this lie, then I'm not upset with that. The truth is you are, and you've just covered that over because you think being upset is not spiritual. But trust me, being upset is spiritual. Right? If it results in you digging deeper and finding the core emotion, the grieving emotion, and releasing it. Being upset is not spiritual when all you do is just stay in your anger and just blame everyone else aside from, and instead of looking at yourself. So, I end up blaming myself. So that's the judgment. Yes, I do. Don't, you've got, you've got to look at the emotional reasons why you do the judgment. And I, I have taken that back. There will be childhood um, emotional reasons. And Always. Yeah. But I can't get past that stage. I mean, I got past the stage of not aware of the actual experiencing it. has been very locked in. Yeah, because you don't want to experience it. Well, probably not. Probably I can recognize this. Not probably not. And I also recognize you, you don't that want that to experience it. Yes. Now, can, I, can I just say something about a truth thing here? If I am not right now experiencing the emotion I know exists in me, I don't want to experience it. Just, yeah. I just I do not. Right now, but I also go off and say I know that's when it's too hard. Yep. Okay. And there'll be fears associated with why you don't, and there'll be other you know, emotions associated with why you don't. Yep. Okay. Mary, you wanted to add some things to that? Uh, I was just going to say, when I did my inventory, I had um, it is on, just need to hold it the, um, the experience that I had was that I had told myself a story about being a very moral person, um, so that was all in my intellect, but that was a big story that I created to avoid these feelings of shame, um, and that I must be a terrible person. And what I, so I had a lot of self blaming emotions in there as well. What I found is when I went into it really sincerely and emotionally, when I got underneath um, those blame and shame emotions, I could deal with the core emotions that were driving it. And then the truth that I found from God's perspective was actually, yes, I had done these things, but God loves me. And you know, it was a whole new sense of um, faith and a loving truth as well. Yeah. So it, I had a lot of fear about it being a very critical and blaming um, process as well. But it, it actually turned out to be uh, turned out to be opposite to that. Yeah. So you see, it's like uh, self blame, self shame is the same as blame for somebody else. It's all an emotion of self deception. <clears throat> it's an emotion of self deception so that it can get you away from experiencing the causal emotion. We always create emotions of self-deception in order to stay away from what the causal emotion is. Mm -hmm. right? So quite often I'll be, someone will come to me and say, oh, what's the causal emotion within? I say, well, these are the emotions that are within you. You feel very angry about that, and underneath that is this and whatever. And they go away feeling like they've just been annihilated. Mm -hmm. right? That's another, that's a self-deception emotion. And that prevents you from accessing the real emotion the grief, the deep grief, and other emotions that you face about the truth of yourself. We'll talk about emotions of self-deception in another session, but you can see how the truth is related to this. Most of the time what we're doing is we're actually living in our emotions of self-deception. Most of the time that's what we're doing. And until we get to at one with God, we will be doing that. We'll be living in varying degrees of emotions of self-deception. Once we get to be at one with God, you will no longer have an emotion of self-deception. But until that point in time, there are going to be emotions of self-deception that you are needing to experience. An emotion of self-deception is there to prevent you from feeling a deeper emotion that is more painful. So many of you will kick into a self-blame emotion, for example, and feel terrible crying, you'll be grieving, crying about how terrible you are. 
You're in an emotion of self-deception. You're allowing yourself to feel that emotion because right at that moment there's a truth you don't want to experience. And that is the emotional pain of what's underneath that emotion. Right? Which might be this terrible feeling of being unloved or unwanted or whatever it is, right underneath it. And instead of letting yourself feel that, you want to feel the emotion of self-deception instead. Because it's more easily felt. And it means you can get away from the emotion underneath. Does everyone follow me? The problem with that state is that you think you're doing the emotional work that we're talking about, and that's not true, you're not. We're not doing the emotional work when we're in an emotion of self-perception. We're doing the emotional work when we actually get to the causal emotion. When you're in emotions of self-deception, your law of attraction does not change. That's the way you know that you're in an emotion of self-deception. Your law of attraction will not change. Your law of attraction, when your law of attraction changes, you know you just dealt with a causal emotion. That's why your law of attraction is your messenger of truth. So getting back to the truth issues, one of the truth issues about divine truth is that divine truth always buzzes. <laughs> <laughs> and my battery's running out, that's why it's... Uh, I'll just uh, change this. How are we doing now? Ooh, this is the trouble with these wires. Right. <laughs> Next one. Divine truth is always respecting free will. Um, so divine truth will never compel a person to receive the truth if it's against their will. Do you understand what I mean by that? So, so this straight away gets rid of all wars. Can you see how that would occur? What's a war? It's compelling another person or a group of people to accept what you feel is true. Isn't it? And you're willing to kill them to compel them. That's the war. Well, divine truth prevents all wars. Because we will no longer allow ourselves to get involved in a situation where we're pushing another person to do anything they don't want to do. We might encourage them, we might tell them the truth about it, but we will allow them to express their free will. We won't compel them with force. Can you see how a lot of parenting has a bit of problem with divine truth? You look back in your lives as parents uh, with children, can you see how many times you compelled them against their will to do something? Every time you did that, you broke the law of divine truth. Every single time. Now for me, that was like hundreds of times. Hundreds of times where I did that. And I've had to actually feel that emotion to get through that emotion. So, respecting free will is even down to the fact that if you know somebody else doesn't want to do something, and you manipulate them through a series of events, or you manipulate them with your words to get them to do it, even though you know that they don't really want to do it, you're breaking the law. Can you see how that changes a lot of interactions with all sorts of things going on in the world around us. Just that. Now once I feel that in my heart, I will never want to manipulate you into doing something you don't want to do. Ever. Even when I know you don't want to do it, but you don't know. So let's say we have an effect where I know you don't want to do something, I can feel that, and you think you do want to do it. I will not ever compel you to do it under those circumstances. You think you want to do it, but your soul is where the free will comes from, not your head. If the emotion is you don't want to, then I will not be able to compel you to do it against that will you have within yourself. 
Does that make sense to everyone? <clears throat> now, initially when we hear that, we go, well, how do I know what everyone's feeling? Well, we don't need to worry about that yet. All we need to do is focus on the fact of free will and doing that, focusing on that first. As you progress in your own emotional condition, you'll feel the emotional condition of others and therefore you'll know whether their will is being compelled or not when you ask them to do something. Or they are even offer to do something for you. So I've had people offer to do things for me that I've refused because I can feel that at the free will level they do not want to actually do it for me. Or that they want to do it for me for totally different reasons than what they think they want to do it for me. So sometimes they think, oh, I'm just being friendly and doing something. And the feeling I'm getting is there's a transaction that involved where they want me to do something in return. Or they feel that they're paying me for something that I've done. And we don't want to do that either. Does that make sense? Jen? Add a microphone, if we can. I don't think it's on, is it? How do you actually know when you're coming from a position of injury, the other person's coming from a position of injury? How, how do you actually know? How do you know whether you're damaging their free will or...? How do you actually know where love lies and yeah, whether you're impacting their free will? When you we both, both come from a position of injury. The question I ask myself is, would I be doing this if I was at one with God? But how do you know what it's like to be one, at one with God if you've not been there before? Um, you don't need, need to really... If you can imagine, what does God do with you? Ask yourself, what does God do with you? So, let me give you an example. Um, you decide you're going to drive your car on the opposite side of the road than everybody else. What does God do about that? He allows, he allows that. Yeah. Why? Because that's your free will choice to do that. Okay. Is it is it wrong from love perspective or love of self perspective? From love perspective, it's not wrong. Because you're exercising your free will. Yeah, but is it... your own self-love. Are you breaking a law of love if you do it? In one sense, you are. Well, it depends on how many cars are on the opposite side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, can you see that? Like, like, if the opposite side of the road is full of cars coming in the opposite direction to you, what you're driving, can you see that if I decide... Uh, I'm going to drive on the opposite side of the road. What am I doing? You're taking away I'm, their free will. I'm taking away their free will, but I'm also now in the process of maybe damaging them or myself. Is that love? No. no. Okay, so it's not loving for me to do that. But if I'm driving along the, on the, this side of the road, there's no one, no, not a single car on the opposite side of the road. For as far as I can see, what's the problem with me driving on the opposite side of the road? Not a lot at all, is it? Am I breaking a law of love then? No. No. Can you see every single situation is going to have specific events? Now, let me illustrate this further with you so that you can connect to what's going on, like why, the, why I've said that. If I, I know when I'm breaking laws of love generally, towards myself or to the other person or towards God. Generally, I know. But most of the time, I want to remain completely oblivious to it. Right? Also, I can ask the question, how does God treat me? Because how God treats me is how I should be treating the other person. So let's take this example into a relationship. Does God tell me when I do things wrong? Do you have a little voice in your ear that says, oh, you just did something wrong? You just did something wrong again. You just did something wrong again. Do you have that? Of course. Yes, but where's that coming from, Jen? 
It's coming from your, the resonance within yourself with God, isn't it? Is it not? It's not coming from somebody telling you in your ear. Now, if you want to tell your partner in his ear what he's doing wrong, can you see straight away that I'm now out of harmony with love? This is not what God is doing with your partner. God's not doing that with your partner. God would appeal to your partner, but he wouldn't tell him what to do and tell him when he's wrong all the time. Because in the end, if he doesn't have a desire to know when he's wrong, then he's going to have to work on that with God in his own relationship. See, most of the time what we're doing in relationships is we want the other person to change, so we keep telling them the truth of what we feel is the truth, of course, not necessarily the truth. We want them to change to suit our emotional condition, do we not? Because we're unwilling to make decisions about our own emotions and our own condition and what we believe is true. We don't want to take responsibility for our own emotions, so what we do is we get the other person to take emotional responsibility for us. God doesn't do that either. You know God doesn't do that because God doesn't do it with you. God doesn't make you take responsibility for God's emotions. So why would you do it for another, with another person? You see, all I need to do is ask myself, what is God doing with me? Because whatever God's doing with me is the most loving thing. And if I'm not doing that with another person, then I'm out of harmony with that love. Does that make sense to everyone? There's a lot of silence. <laughs> if God doesn't get in my ear 24-7... Tell me everything I'm doing wrong 24 by 7, right? Then if I'm doing that to another person, am I loving? No. 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 Of course not. Right? So often we need to ask ourselves, what is God doing with me? With your children, for example. Does God come along and tell you you've got to tidy up after yourself? <laughs> <laughs> God doesn't, does she? Like, so you're driving along in your automobile down on the highway, putting up two, kilo, two tons of pollution every year out of your car, minimum. And God doesn't say, now you've got to clean that up. <laughs> Does God say that to you? But that's what you're doing when we're driving on a car. God's, we're doing that, but God's not saying, you've got to clean that up. So why are you then doing it with your child? There's an emotion in the child that's being reflected by your own condition as to why they don't have enough love to tidy up half for themselves. That's what you need to address. That is the truth of the matter. But telling them in their ear that they're doing it and needing to clean them up is not going to address that emotion. All it does is address the effect of the emotion. And remember last week we learned God doesn't deal with effects, ever. God always deals with causes. That's what God wants to do. So if your child is not tidying up after itself, that is an issue for themselves in their own love of self, is it not? They're not looking after their own environment. Therefore, they do not love themselves enough to care for their own environment. And if it's in my child, then it's in me. Because I created them, all of my emotions got impressed upon them. So what they're reflecting to me is the fact that I'm not cleaning up or having a desire to clean up in my own environment, either emotionally or physically. Because I don't have enough self-love to do it. And I need to work my way through that self-love and help my child work its way through its self-love. And then both of us will be tidying up after ourselves without having to be told. Does that make sense to everyone? It's an issue, again, it gets back to an issue of what's going on inside of us emotionally. That is the truth. So a lot of people will look at that same situation and say intellectually, but it's wrong for the child to not tidy up after itself. When you say wrong, I, if, if you use the term unloving, yes, I agree. It is unloving for the child to not look after itself. Totally unloving. But let's address the reason why it doesn't want it. Not the effect of why it doesn't want it. The effect is the untidy room. The reason is far different to that. Does that make sense? If you address the causes, and remember all prayer, remember one of the things we said last week about prayer? All prayer must address causes. God cannot listen to prayer that doesn't address causes. Can you see, most of the time, we're not dealing with causes. So can I just talk about your interaction with Graham this week for a moment? Do you mind? Is that okay? 
Well, you put it in the public arena then, so you know, I'm just asking you whether you want to continue it in, in, in the arena. You, you're allowed to say no, Jen. Sorry? No, but you're allowed to say no, because the feeling I'm getting from you is you prefer not to. You sure? It's interesting I'm having that feeling from you, because you never asked Graham to post your stuff on the net when you posted it. Can you see how there's a bit of hypocrisy there? The question I'm going to ask you though is this. Why do you want to post about your life on the net before it's resolved? There's an emotion in you. Now I can understand fully posting it on the net during the process of resolution or after the process of resolution in particular because from a teaching perspective. I'm doing that with you constantly. So I'm telling you about my life constantly as I've dealt with different emotions and what's going on there. But why do you want to do it with the other person about that? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, there's an issue inside of wanting to punish publicly the other person for their behaviour. I'm not saying, I'm saying it was. But we can disagree on that. And we're allowed to. It absolutely was not about brain. It was about coming to a realisation of how I relate to brain in terms of how I was relating to my father. And that's something that you Yes, but if you reread, and I hadn't seen it, I could, I did not see it. But if you reread your post, you will see the focus was not your father. You mentioned your father and some things, and then you went back to your relationship with Graham, and you didn't want to deal with the underlying emotional cause. I absolutely completely. I agree. But that doesn't make Graham your father. I agree. No, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that. I don't agree that that's what the post was about. The post was about you avoiding the core emotion. I haven't reached what the core emotion is. I know. The reason, the reason why you haven't reached it is because the whole purpose of the post was to avoid it. Every single relationship I've ever had with men, every single one, was exposed in the moment I realised how I relate to brain. Exactly the same. I agree. But the emotion is not flowing in you because you are still having the emotion of self-deception. The emotion of self-deception is the blame emotion, either of yourself or of Graham. Remember I spoke with you about that the last time you visited. The emotion of self-deception is the blame of either one of you. If you can't blame Graham, you finish up blaming you. Agreed? In honesty, when I saw you the last time, we went through two and a half hours of you exposing that many things. I don't actually remember you said that. Maybe. That's okay. I'm saying it again now. That's okay. The emotion of self-deception is the emotion where I want to blame the other person or myself. What happened is when I stopped you from blaming Graham, you then went straight into blaming yourself, which is still the same self-deception emotion. And underneath the self-deception emotion is the truth emotion. The truth emotion is the one that you want to avoid by doing that. So take care of the reason why you're exposing things publicly all the time. And part of that reason is because of this self-deception emotion. Allow yourself to dig deeper than that emotion and get to the real truth of the matter. Right? Whenever I'm harming the free will of another, I'm not in emotional truth. And when I say harming the free will of another, I mean when I'm choosing to make choices that the other person wouldn't make if they had the choice for them, then I am harming them. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. 
So bear that in mind with all of your interactions. It's okay to face these truths. Does that make sense? It's okay to feel these truths. The truth is that I am allowed to do whatever I want. That's one truth. But whenever I harm the free will of another person in doing it, I am going to have an automatic law of compensation about that. That's also another truth. And when I harm the free will of another, I am actually not in harmony with divine truth. Because it's not something God would do. God, To God, your free will is paramount. To God, you're allowed to do anything you want. God already has laws in place that cause a effect on your soul to correct you should you do something that is out of harmony with love and truth. Could you please try and explain to me why I feel so uncomfortable and why I tune out when it seems to be on a more personal level because um, it's sort of I, I miss things very much. Um, I don't want to know. It gets into a more emotional. Right, so how many of you find yourself doing that? Whenever I mention something to someone specifically about their particular situation, how many of you feel very tuned out of that discussion? Because there's quite a lot of you who do for that. Quite a lot. There's a lot more to put up their hand by that. What emotion do you feel is in you when that happens? Because there's an emotion inside of you when that happens. Shame, a personal shame. So a lot of times what I'm talking about with the person is something that you yourself have felt exists within you. Agreed? And then there's this shame feeling that happens and often that feeling is not allowed to rise and so what we have a tendency to do then is to not want to listen and not want to pay attention. So we start tuning out, we start even going to sleep. Many spirits with us do this, by the way. So many of us still have spirit attachments who are trying to help us tune out when they're looking at an emotion. Why will the spirit help you tune out? Because he wants you to keep that emotion. That, if you keep that emotion, he'll be able to stay the most connected with you. But if you lose that emotion, then he won't be able to be connected with you anymore. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of external reasons that happen to us when we start to tune out or, or miss things. The reason why we're doing it is because there's an emotion in us of avoidance. Like, when I notice that happening in myself, I write it down straight away. Because it means a big thing is underneath it, generally. Avoidance of something large within myself. Does that make sense? So, so when I speak individually to somebody, the reason why I've chosen to do that, the reason why I've chosen to speak to Jen about that, is because I know Jen's willingness to deal with her emotions. And I also know that that emotion exists in many of you, but you're not owning up to it. Does that make sense? The emotion of wanting to expose another person and what they're doing wrong exists within many of you, but you don't want to own up to it. And in having this interaction with Jen, we can expose that emotion. But many of you who have done that in the past want to detune from the fact that you've done it. You want to run away from the fact you've done it, so in interaction with Jen, or oh, Jen's taking all the limelight, emotion might come up for you with that, right? Or, oh, Jen's doing this, another motion comes up for you. And the reason why I enter these interactions is so that those emotions come up with you. Allow yourself to feel those emotions rather than skipping over them all the time. Or blaming me or blaming Jen or whatever for the, for the interactions that occur. I feel her being open is a beautiful thing. But many of you feel her being open is a, done for other reasons. So allow yourself to feel through those emotions and work your way through them. But yes, whenever you feel an emotion where you're feeling yourself getting distracted or wandering off, there is always an emotional core of that. So if you can allow yourself to see what caused it, and every time I've traced it back inside of myself, I've noticed there was something that was said. There was just some, there was something that was said or just a little event that occurred, and wham, I was off on another planet. And that was my avoidance. That's the way I got away from that. Does that make sense? Allow you to pull yourself back into it. What am I avoiding? This is a part of being truthful with yourself. So what's next after respecting free will? What's the next? 
emotion with regard to truth. That it won't allow itself to conform to men's beliefs. So if I felt that inside of myself, and another person comes along and says, oh, did you know AJ's a cult leader, right? I'd go, oh, okay, okay, yeah, a bit of fear comes up with that. Oh, yeah, maybe that's right, I'll have to investigate that. And off I go and investigate it. What have I now done? If I haven't already investigated that before that was said to me, what have I done? I've allowed another person and their beliefs to influence my behaviour. Now, it's great that it is because it's triggering an emotion, right? <laughs> but I'm not in a state of love of truth of myself in that state. Because if I had already resolved it, I would already know what to do, whether I agree with them or not. But I wouldn't change what I do just for the sake of another person's beliefs. So I can believe all I want, what I'm saying is true, but if you're changing your beliefs just because I say so, then that's an error. Can you see that? It doesn't matter who I am. If you change your belief just because I say you should, there's an error. See, divine love or divine truth does not conform. to men's beliefs, or women's beliefs. It's very important to understand that. Can you see why? In the end, all of you will come to see the truth, not because I've said it to you, but because you've felt it in your own heart. Right? This is why it's so important to open up your soul. It's the only mechanism you have for determining truth. The only one. Intellectually, you can present, be presented with argument after argument after argument. We can, we can tie up your mind as long as you want, intellectually, to avoid any truth or to make you believe something that's not true quite easily. Isn't that what they do with politics? Give you the spin. Right? Now, men can do this constantly, and this is constantly happening in the universe up until the sixth sphere of the spirit world where you get the spin. But you are only going to be able to determine the truth when you feel the divine truth in your heart and you will no longer conform to any other person's beliefs. So, how could I accept the truth in the first century when not a single person around me accepted the truth? Only by not conforming my beliefs to men's beliefs. Why did I do that? Only by connecting with divine truth and feeling the resonance between that truth and what was in my soul by growing in love. That's the only way I'm going to determine truth. That's the only way you're going to determine truth. It will be a personal experience for you. Totally personal. It has nothing to do with me, aside from the fact that I would like to help you with it. But it's got nothing to do with me. It's all to do with how strong a desire you personally have to actually connect to God in that way. And so you can be the only person on this planet who knows the truth. I've experienced that in my own life, in the first century. Where I was the only person who knew the truth. It's a very, it, it can be, if you're not a one with God, a lonely place. But if you're a one with God, you never feel lonely, so it's no longer a lonely place. Does that make sense? So you will get to the stage in your own progression where you know what you are hearing is truth or not truth. You will know the difference between a truth and a lie, not because you intellectually have worked it out, but because you can actually feel the difference between one and the other. And that's a pretty freeing place. Can you see that? Up the back, if the mic. Yep, uh, you might have to hold it quite close. Hey, Jay. Um, I was just wondering, um, I heard you talk about spiritualities and things of that nature, and I was wondering, what is the divine truth behind um, the idea that there are extraterrestrials and uh, UFOs, and that they are interacting with us in a way that may not necessarily be conducive to the, the things that you are asking for? Yep. Um, can I answer that question in a question and answer session that I'm having later? 
the, uh, in you, Lo, because today I'd like to focus more on the issue of truth, not the specific truths. If that, that, a brief, very brief answer is that almost all interactions with these kind of beings are actually spirit interactions. And I'll explain how that's the case perhaps at another time, uh, if I can do that. All right, let's move on to the next one. What's the next one? Truth results in freedom. So divine truth always results in freedom. So let's say you're in a religious movement and, and all of a sudden you get presented with you must not do this, you must not do that, you must not do this, you must not do that. And how free are you feeling now? <laughs> so, so would a religious movement in, ha in harmony with divine truth say you must not do anything and you must do anything? Wouldn't it instead say, if you do this, you will disconnect yourself from love? If you do, don't do that, you'll disconnect yourself from love. But you're allowed to do whatever you want. So would a, would a religion that's harmonious with divine truth ever excommunicate somebody? No. Of course not. Because what's excommunication? It's you naughty person, you're not allowed to do that, so we're going to push you out. From God's perspective, is the person allowed to do it? Yes. yes. Even if it's in disharmony with love, they're allowed to do it, are they not? Yes. So why would I not allow them? And you see that straight away, freedom becomes a very, very important issue. So let's look at all the different things that result in a lack of freedom on the earth. Money results in a lack of freedom on the earth, doesn't it? Like if you haven't got any money, you try living in places where there's no money, and you will feel very severely restricted in, in the current environment. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that the monetary system that we currently have is not loving. And it's not harmonious with divine truth, and it's going to go. The more people come in harmony with divine truth, the more it's going to disappear. And eventually it will disappear forever. The reason why is because it's not resulting in freedom. Let's look at the political aspect of things. Do you feel free when you're driving on the road? Why? Because so many laws, some of which you disagree with, right? Don't you? Like, like you drive up to a stop sign, and there's not a single other person, there's a stop light, I'm saying. You stop, you look left and you look right, middle of the night, 3 a.m., not a single other person on the road. Right? You can't see a, a single car and you have to sit there and wait. <laughs> How free does that feel? And so, so, what would a law that's more harmonious with freedom? If there's not a single other person on the road, just obey the normal stop sign rules and proceed. That would be far more harmonious with love, wouldn't it? Far more harmonious with truth and it result, because it results in freedom. More freedom for you. Anything that results in more freedom for you, as long as it also results in more freedom for the other persons around you, is going to be harmonious with love. But if it results in more freedom in quotation is for you, and no freedom for anyone around you, then that's not love either, and it's not divine truth either. So if I then take the point of view, oh, I'm free, so that means I'm free to rape and pillage, right? then obviously that's not harmonious with love, is it? Because freedom also results in more freedom for everyone around me. Can you see that? Yeah. So, but it's a very important point, freedom. It's also an important point when you look at any religious format, or any political format, or any environmental format, or any whatever you can think of format, financial or so forth. If a law that they create results in less freedom for everyone involved, and more restrictions, then it's unloving. Quite simple. When I feel that in my soul, I will actually feel in my own family when I've created a law that's resulted in less freedom. So give you one, you girl, you've got a teenage girl, 15, just exploring sexuality. <laughs> your, your daddy. Daddies often have a problem with their little girls getting involved with other men, right? So what do they normally do? They make all of these 
laws. You've got to be on my 10, you've got to ring me here, you've got to find it, here's a new mobile phone, you've got to find me, you know, all these laws are all made really to assage or to lessen daddy's fears. Right? And in fact, laws are made generally to reduce your own fear. So are they based on love? No. no. So let's look at what, what would result in freedom. What would daddy do with the girl if he's in a state of making her more free? What would he do there? She's allowed to stay out whenever she wants, for as long as she wants, with whoever she wants. However, what would I also do if I was in love and truth? I would warn her of the possible hard dangers to her soul or the soul of others making the choices. Do you see what I'm saying? I would make her aware of those things. But I would allow her to do it. So with my boys, when they were 15 or so, it's exactly what they did. So um, when they got a car, they didn't have to come home at all. Quite often I didn't know where they were for days on end. And Tristan knows that to be true. Because he's quite often out. <laughs> right? And, uh, and how they, like, it didn't concern me if they were out getting drunk or whatever they were doing. Because I'd already explained to them the love consequences of breaking laws of love. Which, by the way, they felt on quite a number of occasions. Love of self or love of others. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And can you see that that just simplifies your entire life, doesn't it? Instead of having an argument every night with your teenage son or daughter, it's quite easy. But that also means that you're not going to take away from them the effects of their choices. Can you see that? In other words, they don't go out and prank, prank the car and then come home and expect you to fix it for them. And you see, that would also not be harmonious with truth or love. Because if I was harmonious with truth, I would actually say, well, ah, actually, son, you created that, so you're going to have to fix, fix that. Mm -hmm. And if that means your car's out of action now for eight weeks, your car's out of action for eight weeks, sorry about that, son. <laughs> it's a very good law of attraction event, demonstrating to you the importance of whatever it is. Does that make sense? There's no need to do all of these big corrections. Right? Hey, Jay, uh, microphone, microphone, if you don't mind. Where is the second one? Sorry, oh, I counted it back to you, sorry. Oh, the battery's gone, is it? No, no I've replaced it. Yeah. This one's working. Yeah. This one's working good. Um, <coughs> I was just wondering, AJ, I'm slightly... Is there a discrepancy almost or a contradiction between respecting someone's free will if it contradicts um, divine love. So, for example, if they're breaking the law, you know, um, they're not... I, I care about how somebody treats themselves, but I also want to respect their free will. How is one more important than the other? Or, like... So, if, for example, my 12, uh, 10, 11 year old came home and said, I want to start smoking, I would love to say I respect your free will to do so, but I also care passionately about, obviously, how he looks after himself. So Whose house are they coming home to? My home. Okay. But if, if it were outside, should we say, or... Yeah, you know, okay, so she says, oh, or he says, oh, I'm going to start smoking, Mum. Uh, it's your house, I know I can't smoke inside it. Is it right if I smoke outside? I'll be saying, yeah. Do you understand you're killing your body? Yeah. Do you understand there's this emotion in you, actually, the why you want to smoke? And it's probably in me as well. Because if it's my 11-year-old, it's definitely in me as well. Lack of self-love, it'll be related to at some point. You release that emotion, and your child will feel quite different anyway. But even if you release the emotion and your child doesn't feel different, they're allowed to choose to do something that damages them. You wouldn't assist them to do it. So I wouldn't go out and buy the cigarettes. Does that make sense? So I wouldn't help them you know, have the smoke. I would say, well, obviously you're going to have to earn your money, but if they're already earning money to buy that, why would you restrict them? Aside from restricting them in amongst your own environment, in your own free will. In other words, my house, you don't smoke, but you're allowed to smoke outside. That's not my place. And presumably, if I work on the issues that I see being reflected back, that, does it automatically stop that law of attraction with them? Or? Yeah, most of the time, particularly if we've got young children. But as our children get older, obviously it's a little different. But yes, our law of attraction has a huge effect on why our child would choose to smoke when they're 11 years old. Yeah. 
very I'm not much saying, so. by the way, I just thought it was the first example. No, like, I know, it's a, it's an example, but that's a very a no, good example. Okay. Okay. But why would a child choose to do anything at 11 years old? Because there is a law of attraction already within them in their soul condition, which came from their parents. So there's got to be something that's being triggered in the parents. So what often happens is a child of 15 starting to get involved sexually, right? And the parents are in panic mode. Why are you in panic mode? Because there's an emotion in you about sexuality that this is triggering. That's why you're in panic mode. Right? There's an emotion in you that needs to be dealt with and released. When you deal with it and release it, your child may feel completely different about the whole issue without you even having to speak a word to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So always focus on your own emotion. Own your own emotion. That's the key part. Always focus on your own emotion. There is no disharmony between the law of freedom and the law of free will when you look at it from a purely emotional prospect. You have free will, and your free will is just as important as theirs. So you're walking down the trolley, the trolley in the supermarket, your 11, 13-year-old says, can I get some ice cream? You don't feel that ice cream is good for them, and it's your fridge, your money, so you're allowed to say, sorry, no. <laughs> That's your free will. But now, if they've got some money of their own that they've earned, or, or, or they've got money from other sources, if they go and buy it, you can't say no to them now, can you? Because now it's their free will, and again, look at the underlying emotion. What's going on emotionally? Why do they want to eat that particular thing, whatever that particular thing is, if it's damaging to them? Or why do they want to drink that particular substance, if it's damaging to them? You see, many of our teenagers, by the time they're 16, 17, they are already in an emotional state because of our denial of our own emotion. And that's why they want drugs, and that's why they want drink, and that's why they want sex, and that's why they want all these different things in a way that's damaging to themselves, because they're already in the denial of different emotions that we ourselves have been in denial of all of our lives and been unwilling to deal with. So look at the reflection that's coming back. So will I be uh, self? Am I feeling self-righteous towards my son because he's still choosing to eat meat? Um, is there a part of me then, although it makes me feel sick to actually be thought of doing it now, is there still, in truth, a part of me that is angry that I have to change, and that's why he's so there is something inside of you. If you're, let's say, a younger child or you know, young teenage child wants to eat meat in front of you, and in fact, I've seen some do it even more. So their, their parent becomes a vegetarian, and the child eats more meat. <laughs> well, what's going on there? Now, it may not be about the meat issue. It's about a spirit of rebellion. It has the emotion in him of you curtailing his freedom, and so therefore will choose often to do the opposite of what you want. Often they are totally driven by just wanting to do the opposite of what you ask. And that's because of this emotion in freedom that is in them and that, by the way, is in you. Because it could never have got in them without it first being in you. So actually you have an emotion where other people are controlling your freedom and what he's reflecting at you is the emotion you need to work your way through. Does that make sense? So if you can see everything, like none of these laws of divine truth, none of them contradict each other. They may at times seemingly be contradictory when we don't look at them emotionally. But when you feel the emotion of them, we will see there is no contradiction. Yep. Um. And so just with relation to free will, um, I have a mother who insists on finding me every night. Yep. And I have tried to set up with her moratorium or, okay, call me once a week. Yep. Um, I feel very controlled by doing that because I'm saying. Yep. But she, she wants to, and it's. Um... His mum, here's you. You're interacting at the soul level, not the intellectual level. You're trying to interact with your mother at the intellectual level. Mum is demanding attention of you. There's an emotion in you that causes you to respond to her demands of attention. When you release that emotion, and there's a group of emotions associated with it, she'll no longer feel like she needs to impose upon you. If she still, it's very rare that she will continue to do it under those conditions, because she won't feel that emotion from you anymore. Does that make sense? 
So firstly, solve the emotion and resolve the emotion. When you say the words to her, Mum, I don't want you to call anymore, that she's not hearing that. What she's hearing is your emotion, which is, Mum, you're allowed to control me whenever you want. That's the emotion in you. Right? There's a belief in you, an emotion in you. That emotion needs to be released. That's why the law of attraction events occur. When you release that emotion, she will no longer feel the need to control you. Now, sometimes they may still feel the need because of their own emotions. But you'll have no trouble actually saying, Mum, if you ring me again, I'm going to call the police. <laughs> and you won't feel any feelings of guilt about that. You won't feel any feelings of shame about that. You'll feel you've done the right thing by your mum. And you will have, by the way. Because that will trigger her emotion as to why she wants to control you. Does that make sense? Now, what often happens in our interactions with family is that we are driven by guilt rather than, and we don't want to face up that there's, there's often lots of things that we can do to actually prevent these situations. But firstly, focus on the emotion. When you focus on the emotion and release the emotion, you will not feel any guilt about ringing out the police and getting your mum never to call again. Call this. You, you won't feel any problem with that. Can you possibly point a little more finger at what it might be that I'm not? I'll help you do that. Ask yourself the instant you get her call, at the instant you get her call, and you pick up the phone and mum's on the other end, you have a feeling. Feel that feeling and go underneath that feeling. Because that's the feeling that's attracting the emotion. That's the feeling that's attracting the event. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you let yourself feel that feeling, you will work through the issue very rapidly. If you just call the police and not deal with that feeling, she's going to feel very confused. Because the feeling is still coming from you. Right? So deal with the feeling first. So just as we're having a conversation, it's rage, by the way. Rage, yep. So under the rage is what? There's feelings under the rage. The rage is the, the crapping emotion. Grief. There's grief. What kind of, what is the, what's the grief about? Um, I feel like she just calls me for to meet her own needs and she doesn't actually call me to actually see how I am. Spot on. That's exactly her emotion. How do you feel about that? Unloved. You're unloved. And you, by the way, you are unloved. Mm -hmm. I must confirm that. Unseen, unfelt. Unseen? Unvalidated. Uh, so you've already identified all the emotions. But now what you need to do is feel them. The best way to feel them is let mum call again. Say, mum, I'm going to hang up because I need to feel a lot of things. <laughs> and just go straight into the feelings. Straight into the feelings of what you're attracting. Feel those feelings. As you feel those feelings, you will actually feel quite strong emotions, which you will. They're all childlike, childhood emotions that you felt most of your life. And you're dead right, your mum has no interest in you aside from the interest you take in her. And by the way, this is the case for many parents. Uh, now, I'm very being very blunt, and I'm not judging your mum. This is the emotion in her. She's had that emotion in her from her childhood for very similar reasons to what you have it in yours. But allow yourself to feel the grief of those emotions. When you feel the grief of those emotions, you will stop attracting the event, because on a number of levels you will change. You will no longer feel guilt, you will no longer have an emotion within you that you've got to seek approval to be loved. And there will be quite a, a few other emotions that are released in this interaction. And your mum will stop calling you every night. She might call you every second night or third night. And then add the more truth you speak with her. Mum, you don't actually love me. I feel that you actually call me because you just want me to be interested in your life. I feel, mum, you need to go and get your own life. And, you know, you will actually break the umbilical cord between yourself and your mother in doing that because you've still got one in place. And what that will do is it will be great for her too because actually she's living her life through you at the moment or attempting to. But if you feel those emotions and you act in harmony with truth, she'll deal with those emotions as you work your way through yours. Mm. It'll be a very powerful interaction for the both of you if you allow it to occur. Yeah. And you notice I said 
that I've got no trouble saying to my mother, you're not calling me anymore, and if you call me again, I'll ring the police. Why, why would I have no trouble with that? I went through a space with my mum though, and my mum now is starting to watch some of these DVDs, so. <laughs> and so she'll probably hear this at some point. But I went through a space with my mum where I picked up the phone, and mum started talking, and I said, Mum, do you want to resolve our previous conversation? And she said, oh, but, 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 and I said, no, mum, mum, do you want to resolve what was raised in our previous conversation? What was raised in our previous conversation was you, you tried to have me committed. Do you want to resolve that? Emotionally. No. It's usually silent, some of the other Well, no, obviously you don't want to resolve that, that's fine, that's okay, but I don't want to talk to you because I want to resolve that. And so then I'd hang up. A month later, Mum would give me a call, hoping that I'd actually got over it. <laughs> Hello, Mum. Do you want to resolve our previous conversation? <laughs> And I'm, I'm fair dinkum, I do this. <laughs> um, do you want to resolve every... No. <laughs> you want to... Oh, well, I, you know, and by this stage she's starting to get like, oh, but, you know, how can we resolve it? I said, Mum, you need to feel some emotions about it. You tried to have me committed. Like, what do you think that felt like for me? Silence and out. Mum, we can't have this conversation. We've got to talk about these issues. I don't want to talk about any other issue. I'll be happy to talk about this issue for as long as you want. Silence it. Hang on. This went on for nearly nine months. And my mum got to the point where she wanted to talk about the issue. And she did. She spoke about the issue. And when she started speaking about the issue, she started facing the results of her attempt to have me committed. And as a result of that, she started working her way through some emotions. So she started crying on the phone, saying she was sorry, and she felt sorry that of the effect it had on my sons, and I think she actually had a conversation with my sons about how sorry she was about doing it. And she could see, in other words, she started to feel the results of her actions. Does that make sense? And I felt very comfortable with her talking about any issue with her after that. Is it, you can see? Because, it, because she'd actually gone through this process of resolution. Now, of course, for me to do that in a way that was not angry, I had to firstly deal with all of my anger and then my sadness and my grief about having my mother attempt to commit me. Does that make sense? And once I went through all of that, then I could actually deal with her in a space of love, but without compromising. Remember, divine truth doesn't compromise to the sake of peace either. So, so it was a matter of just working your way through that emotion. Josh, thanks. Thank you for our roving microphone, people. Um, I was just wondering if, like, in finding a person you've got an emotional issue with, um, often that will bring up anger, and then, like, the moment the anger is there, you're already projecting, but you're already projecting anyway. Exactly. But is it worse when it's actually coming out of you and being directed? If it's being directed at the person, yes, it is definitely worse. But you don't even have to be saying anything. You just feel anger and walk past the person. And you can just feel like rage going at that person. Yep, that's just as bad. Like my issue is how to jump from that state of anger yep. to feeling the grief or whatever is underneath. All right. So anger is another emotion of self-denial. Uh, sorry, an emotion of self-deception. When we're angry, we're actually denying a deeper emotion of what we're angry about. So the key is to, to even before you have an interaction with a person, to actually work through the emotions of why you're angry. So if I go back to the situation with my mother, the way I found out that my mother had tried to do this was that nine months prior, she, I, I told her who I was and I told her um, you know, that I'm Jesus and so forth, and I told her all these different things, and oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, you know. And I don't know how you would have acted as a mother, but most of you probably would have been most the same. Oh yes, oh yes. And she walks away in this state of absolute panic. He's going to kill himself, or he's going to jump off a building, I don't know what he's going to do now, what's going on, right? This was the emotions playing through in life. So she goes down and has a talk with somebody about it. And in the process of talking about it, this other person 
uh, suggests she, she, she sees a, um, a psych about it. So she goes to a psychologist. The psych says, oh, he's a very dangerous man. You, you've got to do something about this. This is a very, very dangerous situation. And now I've got to, you know, I've got to report it now. So he reports it. And this is all happening unbeknown to me. Mum comes back next month, as if nothing's happening. And the month after, so she'd been visiting me for quite a few months, once a month. Um, of course, during this phase, she didn't want anybody else to know she was visiting me either. So, so she was visiting me privately, and even my family, the rest of my family, didn't know she was visiting me. Anyway, she, she, uh, she's listening to more about, oh, yes, she's asking questions now. Why, why do you feel you're Jesus? And what's going to explain all these different things. And anyway, uh, so, like, I have no idea that all this is happening behind the scenes. And my insurance, I, I had a business which was a property development business, and I had to be insured for all of the money that I had borrowed. So I had a personal insurance covering all the money that I was borrowing, and if I didn't have that personal insurance, and they wouldn't give me or loan me more funds to do my development work. So, so what happened is once a year, every year, I had to go and see a doctor. And I get a, I get a, a physical and a, and a psychological evaluation. And, um, and then they, you know, he writes a report to the insurance company. And the insurance company says, no worries. Uh, we can, we're OK with insuring him for a higher value, which allows me to actually borrow more funds. And so uh, I go, I get called to the doctor just as a normal part of my you know, medical. And the doctor says, oh, you know, he does a physical, it's looking pretty good. Uh, then he says, oh, I see you're having uh, psychological problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, no, not to my advantage. I'm not having any psychological problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he says, yeah. I said, oh, okay, like, okay, enlighten me. <laughs> like, he says, well, you know, I've got a report here that says that actually uh, you're saying you're Jesus. Okay. He says, is that wrong? I say, yes. Yes, that's right. I'm saying I'm Jesus. Oh, okay. And he is quiet for a while. You don't see any problem with that? And I said, no. He said, well, this, is, this actually happened. He says, uh, He's really getting quite annoyed with me, too. and he's saying, "Well, you know, surely you see a problem with that, you know? Like, you're not Jesus." And I said, "How do you know?" <laughs> he said, "Well, I said to him, look, are you saying that I'm crazy because I'm saying I'm Jesus? Is that what you're saying?'" He said, "Yes." <laughs> and I said, "Well." Um, do you believe in God at all? And he goes, rolls his eyes, says, no, I don't believe in God. And I said, well, how many of your, uh, you know, your patients believe in God? Like 50%. And we live in a very religious environment, you know, it's like when I, where, where I was, and say so probably a good 30 or 40% would have uh, um, believed in God. You know? And, and he said, I was saying, so you've got no patients that believe in God? He said, oh, you've got lots of patients that believe in God. Okay. I said, so, so you are, are you actually saying they're crazy too now, or what? Like, this is a belief that doesn't agree with your beliefs. My belief just doesn't agree with your belief. You can't prove that I'm wrong, just like you can't prove that they're wrong. So, so, you know, why are you now saying I'm crazy when you're not saying all these people are crazy? I don't get that. Now he's starting to get a bit annoyed. <laughs> and he said, so, so, so he couldn't answer that one, so I, of course, skipped over that one. And I said, no, no, let's get back to the subject. Like, you're accusing me of, like, being crazy, but, but you've got no evidence whatsoever that I am. None whatsoever. In fact, I said to him, uh, I suggest you, I, by the, at this stage I was living by myself and I had a three-bedroom house. Come and live with me for a month and you'll see whether I'm crazy or not is what I suggested. No, I can't do that. I said, no, no worries. Okay, have you got anybody who might be able to evaluate me that can come and live with me and see if I'm crazy or not? No, I can't do that. He would just much rather just say I'm crazy because I'm saying Jesus. 
And I said, well, well, I don't know what we can do about this because I know who I am. And you've got no idea who I am, and that's understandable because you don't live with me. And you don't know what's going on inside of me emotionally or intellectually or my memories or anything like that. You've got no idea. You're just judging it based on what my mother says. Oh, I said, by the way, my mother's a Jehovah's Witness. Did you know that? Oh, no. I said, oh, and do you agree with their teachings? Because they believe that Jesus is returning and all sorts of things. My mum just doesn't want to believe it's me. <laughs> He came to we came to an agreement. He said, uh, he said, look, um, he said, I can't, I can't say that you're psychologically um, okay. I said, okay. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. Right? It's his free will, isn't it? Like he's allowed to make that choice. And he said, now, I want to, I want, I want you to come back um, in a year's time, and you know, if you've worked through this issue and you feel differently about it. If you don't work through this issue and you still feel the same, then you know I'd like to talk further with you about this issue. And I said, well, why would I want to do that? I already know who I am. And I'm just sitting here trying, you know, why would I want to sit here and convince a person who doesn't ever, is never going to believe who I am, uh, any of the evidence either, who I am? Like, I don't want to do that. So I'll just agree. I said, oh, look, I'll agree at some point in the future you'll meet me and you'll realise that what I said to you was true. Um, but aside from that, I can't do anything unless you want to go further with it. But anyway, he decided to not go further with it. Uh, because in the end, I think I, my logic was too logical for what he was actually, <laughs> he was actually saying. So, so he just gave up doing anything further, but he refused to sign the document. What that meant was that uh, I could no longer develop. So my job was just like, gone, like that. And, uh, and so that, of course, I had a lot of emotion about that. Um, and uh, it was my only form of livelihood. And, uh, and at the time, I had a number of other emotions about money and self-sufficiency and all these other things, which I've since worked through. But um, I had to deal with that emotionally. My mother actually going through that process. Does that make sense? And allow myself to work my way through it emotionally. Once I worked my way through it emotionally, and I, I, it took about a month, then I raised it with my mother. Because by that stage, I'd released all the emotions of being in a rage with her, being angry with her, you know, and then underneath the emotions of like my mother not even knowing me, doesn't want to know me, doesn't want to, just wasn't even believing any conversation I was having with her. Um, all the memories that I talked about with her, she just didn't want to believe any of them. So there was a lot of emotions about that and a lot of emotions about being rejected by my family because I had been rejected much, much earlier about my family and had not dealt with some of those emotions. So there was a lot of emotions to work my way through. And once I worked my way through those emotions, I could talk to my mother with love, but not compromise. And so that's what I suggest. If you're in a rage yourself, work. if you know what you're in a rage about, work through it. Deal with the underlying emotions of it. When you feel you've done it, go and talk to the person. Because most of the time when you feel you've done it, you've yet to finish it. But if you feel you've done it, go and talk to the person and let whatever comes up as a residual effects of that come up and deal with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then when you do that, what will happen is your law of attraction will change anyway. Ironically, after that time, my mum started actually feeling that maybe I might be right. And now, Mum is actually now uh, watching the videos that are being produced um, about all this stuff. And the last time she actually came to visit me, we had very long chats about the Law of Attraction and how the Law of Attraction works. And, uh, but she's still having difficulty um, understanding how her son knows all these things <laughs> when she knows nobody taught me them. So she's having a lot of difficulty with that, obviously. But, but can you see how even the law of attraction will change when you live in truth about and don't compromise the truth about all those events? Now, I could have skipped over all that. I could have said to mummy, mum, look, uh, you know, I could have said, oh, I've already forgiven you when I had. I could have also skipped over it and I could have said, mum, you know, I don't want to see you anymore. But that's not very beneficial either to either. It's not really loving to ban someone from your life. 
So I could, you know, could have gone through lots and lots of different stages, but in the end, hopefully, I would have ended up with the same stage where I feel now, which is a deep love for my family, the same way as I feel my deep love for you. It's no different, my love for them or you. And I feel also this deep feeling that everything down the track will work out quite well. Um, but that is after lots of emotions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Jenny? So I really appreciate everything that's been said about Mother, particularly the lady down the front. I had a relationship with my mother based on guilt, and it's only through that lady's articulation of her relationship and the phone calls that I've just started to see how my relationship with my mum, um, you know, I'll confirmly say I deeply adored my mother. Yep. I just loved her. Yep. But she's now in spirit, so that's why I'm sharing this. My mother's now in spirit, and I still feel really blocked in regard to her. Feel really deep feelings of guilt, and like I still need to serve her, that I need to hold her memory up to some kind of Ideal. glory. Yeah. Um, I'm having trouble with my mediumship skills yep. because I feel like because she won't communicate with me from spirit because she's blocked in anger, yep. I'm also blocked in it as well. Yeah. So um, I when, brought it up because my mother's in spirit and so um, I wrote down everything that, that I there, There's a couple of things that, that I'd like to say with you if I could. The issue, the issue is going to be with both you and your mum is truth, the issue of truth. At the moment, there's a set of truths that you're telling yourself that are not actually true. Like one of those truths is that you said that you deeply love your mother. It's something that you currently believe, but actually it's not true. It's not true because there is also a deep rage towards your mother. And the deep rage is about how you were not protected when you were young and how she knew about sexual abuse that was occurring with you and, and, wasn't, and didn't protect you. So there's a lot of very, very dark emotions that you also feel towards your mother. And the reason why they're not being released is because you want to maintain the internal truth that I actually love my mother. So the key is for you to la allow yourself to start digging deeper than that and start seeing actually those deeper emotions. For her, it's very similar. She had a very similar relationship with her own mother. And at the moment, she's very focused on feeling things towards you, blaming you, rather than actually looking at her own emotions towards her own mother and father and what they needed to do with it. In each case, the truth is what's going to expose everything. And not compromising about the truth is very important. The truth is that you have some very strong emotions in you of anger towards her. And you can't love a person while you're in a rage with them. Right? So allow yourself to feel the rage and then dig deeper under the rage into these deeper emotions and allow yourself to feel the truth. The truth, the, some of the feelings of truth are mum did not protect me. Mum did not care for me. Mum cared about herself more than me. And so forth. And many of these feelings that you have, Jen, are actually true. Right? The truth is mum did not care for you more than she cared for herself. She, she cared for herself far more and didn't really care so much about what was happening to you, particularly sexually. The truth is that your mum knew events that were occurring that were damaging to you and refused to deal with them emotionally. She knew what her husband was like and refused to leave him for lots of different security reasons within herself. She sacrificed you on her altar of lies. And I'll say that again because it's the one thing to be very specific about. She sacrificed you on her altar of lies. And many of us do that as parents in order to stay away from our own emotions. And again, your mum has just as much ability to progress in divine love as do any of us here. So she doesn't need to judge herself for any of these things. She does need to feel the emotions of what she's created. 
Yes, it is. And particularly, you know, your sons definitely feel that pattern. Um, where they feel very responsible for you and they feel like they love you dearly, but actually there is some deep rage and anger within them for the very same reasons, the very similar reasons. Uh, when you heal the emotion in you, you find your children will heal the emotion in them much more rapidly. All right, what's another one of these uh, ones? A fearless existence, yeah? <laughs> Fearless existence. Divine truth results in a fearless existence. By the way, I'm not going to cover them all because we're not going to have time. And every single time you become afraid, you are no longer in a state of love. And ironically, you are also no longer in a state of truth. The reason why is that fear is false expectations appearing real to you, right? So every time you're in a state of fear, it's because you expect something that's actually in error from God's perspective. Now, it may be not in error from the perspective of man. So, for example, you decide to not pay your taxes, from a man's perspective, that's going to be perhaps in error. But it's only in error from God's perspective if you lie about it. Does that make, can you see the difference between the two? Or if you expect the government to provide you with things that you're not now paying taxes for. So in other words, oh, I expect my government to grow, grade my road, but I'm not going to pay taxes for that. Right? Then obviously now I have unjust expectations, which is also an error. Mind you, the government could grade your road without charging for taxes at all. They have other means of raising revenue. Uh, which is including the printing of funds, but because of the world's economic system, they don't do that anymore. So that's one reason why you pay taxes. So there's all these things involved with the paying of taxes, but in the end, if you were living in a fearless existence, you wouldn't be afraid of authority, would you? So therefore, you wouldn't be afraid of what they could do to you. Would you then be afraid of losing your house? No. You wouldn't be afraid of losing your car. You wouldn't be afraid of being put in jail. You wouldn't be afraid of anything. Can you see that? If I'm afraid of any of those things, I still have an emotional injury to work through. And I am afraid of some of those things myself still. So I have some emotional injuries to work through about fear as well. That's why I'm going through what I'm going through this week. <laughs> but when we get to a point of a one with God, we will be fearless. When we actually long for divine truth with all of our heart, we will actually be also fearless. And it won't matter to us what goes on around us. We will not be afraid of the outcome. <coughs> That's a lot of freedom, isn't it? But it also means dealing with a lot of released emotions. Because most of us have some emotions about fear inside us. So one of the things I mentioned about fear was if uh, I was... Uh, where did I have it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and this is one thing I wanted to raise with regard to this property thing that people have been. By the way, there's been a few emails coming back for Peter saying, oh, now we know what AJ's really up to. You know, he's going to become a cult leader now. You know, now what we're saying. Yeah, obviously they weren't at the group, at the group were they? But, um, that statement is a statement of fear. Can you see that? Whether I'm a cult leader or not, it's still a statement of fear. So why would you want to have that fear in you? So most people have a lot of fear in them and make lots of decisions. Even down to not understanding what fear causes us to do. Many of you plan with detail in your life, don't you? Yes. So you have a feeling to do something, and then what do you do? You get all the facts together. Right? And you pour over the facts, pour over the facts, pour over the facts, and then you weigh up all the options, positive and negative. What's happening to your feeling, by the way, at this stage? It's way, way out there, isn't it? Like it's hardly even being noticed anymore. And you're in this state of actually analysing facts and details, right? We're in a state of fear, in that state. 
Whenever you want to control the future, whenever you want to know what the future is going to be, whenever you want to, you're in a state of fear. The key is just accept that. I'm in a state of fear. What's my fear about? You know? Fear comes from it at its root cause, comes from a lack of reliance on God. That's its root cause. Can everyone see why that would be the case? If I completely relied with all my heart on God, would I ever be afraid again? So obviously there's an emotion I'll need to work through. When I work through that emotion, I will then be in this fearless state. And so even me wanting to know, like, like, let's say we're all about to buy a property together. Even me wanting to know how much you can donate is a fear. Can you see that? Why would I want to know that? We either get enough money or we don't get enough money. <laughs> Right? If we get enough money from the desire of everyone together, then we'll buy the property. If we don't, then we won't. Why would I be afraid either way? Can you see? It's all driven by fear. Oh, I want to know when somebody wants to be paid back. Why do I want to know that? Because I think I might not have the money when they want to be paid back for them to be paid back. What am I afraid of? I'm afraid that my law of attraction won't bring me the funds that are necessary to do what needs to be done. I need to deal with that fear. See, on the Divine Love Path, can you see how everything is focused on your law of attraction? So everything is then focused on you allowing it to trigger the emotion in you and deal with that emotion. Every time you plan for the future, you're planning to work around your law of attraction. Can you see that? Can you see how every time I plan for an event in the future, I'm really what I'm doing is I'm trying to work out what might happen in the future and I will then have a plan to work around that. But if that event would happen in the future, then that was my law of attraction, to bring an emotion to, my, to the surface within me. That's God's messenger of truth to me. Why would I want to work around it? Can you see? Why would I want to work around that? I was a meticulous planner. Every single night, I would write down everything I was going to do the next day. And on many occasions, I would also write down everything that could go wrong the next day and how I was going to fix every one of those things. Now, of course, a lot of those things never even happened, but I still did this. And in the end, it's because of all of these emotions of not wanting to understand the truth in the end, that God has me in her care. Everything that happens to me is something to release an emotion that will help me go and grow. Can everyone see that? Uh, just wait for the mic. Um, no. When you get your law of attraction is working perfectly, everything will come to you just when you need it. You won't need to book things ahead, you won't need to. None of that. Ah, but see, now you're triggering emotion, you see. The emotion is, oh, but the money's involved. So there's an emotion around money when I worry about that. Why would I worry about that? If I have unlimited funds and I believe I'm super abundant, why would I ever be concerned about making the monetary decision? So how many of you get the early flight because it's cheaper? Yeah, you've got a problem with money. You, don't, you have a problem with how much you're worth. Does that make sense? Because if you're worth more, you wouldn't do that. How many of you get the different, a different, you know, vegetable, fruit, or you know, produce because it's on sale? You got a problem with money. If it's not really what you wanted, you got a problem with money. Can you see? Like these are all just things triggering these emotions constantly happening around us. And if I was in this state where I was abundant, would I worry about those things? If I loved myself, would I worry about those things? No, I would not worry about those things at all. And ironically, my law of attraction would be so strong that whatever I desired would automatically happen for me anyway. That's where all of you are headed, to that place, where you don't have to worry about anything. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> Just imagine me that place. <laughs> it's awesome. And you'll find as you work through these issues of truth rapidly, you'll get to that place a lot, a lot quicker. So you'll be absolutely surprised by your law of attraction. Really surprised, you know, you'd like you want something and all of a sudden somebody will give it to you or you know, something will happen, exactly what you want it comes to you. 
You know, you'll get gifts given to you of all sorts of things. And also, you know, many of you don't believe that can happen at the moment. And that's why it's not happening, because there's emotions in you, oh, that can't happen to me, you know, I'm not worth that. You know, there's all these emotions we have to work through first. But once we do, we'll be in a totally different state. Yeah. Now, it's half past uh, five, actually. Um, interesting discussion, though, truth, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What, what I suggest you do with the stuff that we haven't covered is to go through it yourself and just allow yourself to meditate about these principles of truth and how, when they are in you emotionally, how they will change your life. The reason why I suggest you do that is because many of us still have a hate of truth here in the emotions. We have a, you know, we're so worried and afraid of truth in ourselves emotionally. And part of the thing that can help us get out of that state and into the state of joy of truth is by actually reflecting upon what the joy will be living in these places. Many of us have this terrible fear of what our life will be in that place. And we're not yet fully emotionally grasping how powerful and joyous our life will be in that state of space. So allow yourself to meditate and feel about how powerfully joyful your life's going to be once you're in this space of love and truth. And allow yourself to start breaking down the barriers that you have inside of yourself as to why you're rejecting truth in your life. Because when you reject the truth in your life, you're also rejecting your emotions. You're, you're, you're rejecting your true self and you're rejecting God while you're doing that. So my suggestion is to do the opposite to that. Start allowing the truth to really influence your life right across the board. Allow the emotions to flow up and allow yourself to feel them. All right, well, thank you very much for today again, guys.